Okay. Okay, good morning and welcome to today's Finance Committee meeting. My name is Daniel Drum and I'm the chair of the committee. We're joined today by Councilmember Robert Cornegie, Councilmember Adrian Adams, Councilmember Andy Cohen, Councilmember Rory Lansman, uh, Chair of the Subcommittee on Capital, um, uh, Councilmember Vanessa Gibson, uh, and Councilmember uh, Barry Grudenchik as well. Uh, and we will be joined by other members as we move along. Um, today's hearing will examine two budget modifications recently submitted by the administration to the council for consideration. The New York City Charter vests the council with the authority to adopt the budget for the city for the ensuing fiscal year. The adopted budget approves appropriations at the unit of appropriation level for every agency. However, throughout the year, operational or programmatic shifts may require funding to be moved within or between units of appropriation or agencies. In certain instances, the Charter requires that the Mayor return to the Council to seek approval to effectuate these mid-year changes for uh, two appropriations. These approvals are sought through budget modifications. Today we are considering both an expense budget modification and a revenue budget modification. Both modifications seek Council approval to implement the fiscal 2018 changes reflected in the most recent November and preliminary financial plans and the expense budget modification also reflects changes made at the Council's request to effectuate certain discretionary funding designations as set forth in the transparency resolutions passed by the Council. Before we ask questions of Ken Godner, First, Dep uh, First Deputy Budget Director at OMB and Chuck Brisky, Deputy Director at OMB. I'll briefly describe the specific actions contained in the two modifications. The budget, the, the revenue budget modification, MN7, would recognize $783.8 million in new revenues for fiscal 2018. This includes $493.7 million in tax revenues 190.1 million in miscellaneous revenue and 100 million in reduced disallowances. These new revenues combined with a $400 million reduction in prior year payables and a $1.4 billion reduction of the general reserves for a total of $2.58 billion will be added to the budget stabilization account to prepay debt services for fiscal 2019. After these actions, $300 million will remain in the general reserve for fiscal 2018 as, historic, as is historically customary for this time of year. The expense budget modification, MN6, would transfer $970.3 million between various units of appropriation in fiscal 2018. The net effect of these transfers on the budget will be zero. Some of the major actions in this modification that we look forward to hearing about today are the homeless shelter re-estimate that would add $169.9 million to the budget of the Department of Homeless Services and an addition of $41.8 million for the school bus grant program administered by the Department of Small Business Services. Today's hearing is a departure from business as usual when the Council would hold a brief hearing on budget modifications immediately before we voted on them. However, the budget modifications that are before us today contain, a very large, contain very large movements of funding. Uh, had they been included at the budget adoption, would have, been received, would have received more public scrutiny and oversight than has historically been given to budget modification actions. Moving forward, the Council contends that significant new spending, particularly that which represents important policy decisions, such as shelter operation funding, should be part of the adoption process. The intention of today's hearing is therefore to gather information from OMB about why these new needs and funding shifts are being made mid-year and have a public discussion about their impact on the City's budget and the Administration's priorities. And now I'd like to welcome the administration uh, who is here. I mentioned their names already, and I'm going to ask council to swear them in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. I do. OK, 
Okay, so for this hearing, we're not going to have testimony from the administration. We're going to go directly to questioning. And let me start off a little bit talking about uh, homeless shelter, the homeless shelter reestimate. The modification would provide $152 million to the Department of Homeless Services as a result of a reestimate of funds needed to support shelter operations for fiscal 2018. This is not the first time that the shelter operations budget has been readjusted mid-year. The recent increase between the adopted budget and actual spending related to shelter spending was 15% in 2014, 23% in fiscal 2015, 21% in fiscal 16, and 40% in fiscal 17. So as you can see, it continually goes up in terms of the percentage. Uh, while the council recognizes that the shelter population fluctuates and some re-estimates will be needed uh, mid-year, why has the variance between the adopted budget and the amount that is modified mid-year been so large and increased so much? Thank you, Chairman. It's important to remember that for the first time uh, we've baselined these adjustments. As we've done in the past, we continuously monitor the shelter budget and do re-estimates as necessary to meet spending obligations. The cost of shelter depends on several factors, including the number of people in the system, the composition of the household types, the cost of shelter units, security needs, among other things. As you know, one year ago, we announced our turning the tide plan to transform the city's approach to providing shelter. We've eliminated the use of, largely eliminated the use of shelter sites and of uh, hotel facilities as our goal, and opened smaller number of new of 90 new, more efficient and traditional shelters. So, what are you doing to improve those estimates uh, moving forward? Because um, you know, fiscal 14 was. Um, 15% uh, in fiscal 14, 23% in 15, 21%. Those numbers keep going up. Why is that? I don't understand why that's getting so much larger. So what are you going to do to improve the situation? We're constantly looking at the forecast, attempting them to produce the best numbers possible at the time, given the number of factors that control the, the cost of providing shelter. Remember, one of the reasons for increasing costs in this program is that we have moved away to the extent we can from clusters, which are our least expensive method of providing shelter, uh, towards shelters and, and hotels, which are more expensive. So why does the administration continue to invest in um, the shelter programs rather than in um, actual permanent housing? I think it's important to remember that this administration has made an unprecedented investment in affordable housing offering new programs to help finance 300,000 affordable homes. In fact, last year, the city financed more, the most affordable homes since 1989. Over the past year, we've also made significant investments to prevent homelessness, rehousing people who've become homeless, and bring people in from the streets. While we invest in prevention, rental assistance, and housing programs, the city is still mandated to provide shelter to all homeless people and our investments meet this mandate, as well as ensuring that we have high quality and safe shelters, which I know is a shared goal for everyone here. What type of investment is being made in permanent housing? Well, as I said, uh, we have been uh, running a number of programs, a total of which helped to finance 300,000 affordable homes. and. Uh, a combination of those programs, we financed the most affordable homes since 1989. Okay, well, it's the council's position, if I can say, that um, we continue to find solutions to um, providing permanent housing rather than continuing to um, increase support for shelters. So will you in the future work with us to um, inform us or to work with us on future modifications to the homeless shelter uh, allocations. Yes, we are, we are pleased to work with the council on this and to go through our plans, including affordable housing plans. Okay, because we really want to be a full partner in that decision-making process. Um, let me talk a little bit about um, disallowances for federal and state aid. 
The reserve for disallowances of federal and state aid is a type of reserve to cushion any shortfall in expected federal and state aid. Recognizing that the city has socked away more than uh, needed for this contingency, the administration has begun to reduce the cushion. So from fiscal eight, 16 to 17, the reserve for disallowances of federal, state, and other aid was reduced from roughly 1.1 billion to around 550 million. The modification reduces the reserve again, this time by about $100 million. Considering that these funds represent a one-shot infusion to the budget, why is the administration comfortable pulling a further $100 million from the reserve? Uh, should it be, uh, should it be um, held for a rainy day? Let me explain to everyone here uh, generally what the disallowance reserve is. So this reserve is designed to cover any major clawbacks from federal or state grants that are, few, that are disallowed under audit. When we, make the, when we calculate the value of the reserve, disallowances are, are, are calculated each year based on the amount of federal and state grants reported for the previous five years. In the current fiscal year, the release in the disallowance reserve is a result of a reduced risk for disallowances attributable to prior years. So we're looking back um, at the grants that we've received over the prior five years, the audits that have been conducted, and the likelihood that there might be some kind of uh, disallowance of previously uh, granted funds. Uh, at this point, based on those calculations, we've lowered what, our, what we believe is a reasonable reserve for that contingency. So does balancing the budget on these one shots mean um, that effectively we're unable to um, balance the budget on, re on reoccurring resources? And um, if so, are we spending outside of, um, of our means? Reestimating the disallowance reserve is appropriate and it would be inappropriate to hold funds in the reserve in excess of what we thought represented a reasonable risk for the contingency of a federal or state clawback under one of their grant programs. Okay, uh, let me go to uh, something on the school bus grant program. The expense budget modification includes an additional $41.8 million for fiscal 2018 for the school bus grant program. This program provides additional funding for school bus operators for increased cost for experienced workers as a result of changes that the DOE made to busing contracts at the end of the 2013-14 school year. And I remember being in the room in the hearing uh, when it was quite a contentious uh, situation uh, regarding the EPP and protection for school bus drivers and workers. Uh, the program was authorized at one, at one point um, for one year by local law 44 of 2014 and continued by agency rules after the legislative authority expired. In terms of funding for the program, the administration spent $28.1 million in fiscal 15, $32.9 million in fiscal 16, and $38 million in fiscal 17. Now, given that the administration has consistently spent tens of millions of dollars on this program each year, why was the need for fiscal 18 not included in last year's executive budget? And um, why was it first included um, in the November plan? First, I'd like to just say that, you know, this, this program is very important. We trust these drivers to get our children to school safely every day and that they deserve to be paid a fair wage. Um, we assess the grant program each school year and make a determination based on the circumstances of the time, including the legal situation at DOE. Uh, part of this process includes our constant effort every year to request a change in state law, which in the long term would obviate the need for the program. So the preliminary budget for fiscal 19 includes only about $140,000 in administrative uh, costs. So if the program's being included um, or continued next year, why isn't this need reflected in the preliminary plan? Well, first, remember that uh, the issue of next year's grant program is not included in the, in the mod that's before us today. But uh, we're going through the budget process, 
and we'll share information with the uh, council when the executive budget is issued. So we can expect to see it in the exec budget? We are preparing the exec budget now and we'll address those issues when they're released. So what is the rationale for continuing the program uh, moving forward? Well, again, you know, it's important to remember that, that you know, these are the people, men and women, <clears throat> who drive and escort our children to school every day. We believe they deserve to be paid, paid a fair wage, and we, this program is the best way that we have right now to continue that to be the case. And when will you be making that decision about whether to include it? The decisions are under review right now. <clears throat> I can't give you a definite time when, when we'll, we'll have that decision, but obviously once we do, we'll, we'll report that to the council. Well, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear we'll, you. We'll, we'll share that with the council. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about state and federal reimbursement for fringe benefits. The state and federal government pay for a good deal of the personnel service cost at a number of agencies as these agencies carry out certain state and federal programs and services. This modification includes a number of reimbursements from the state and feds for fringe benefits, including over $50.7 million this year at ACS. Can you explain how those fringe um, rates are negotiated? So each year, the city negotiates the fringe rates with the federal government related to certain uh, with the federal and state government related to certain federal and state grants. The rates are, are based upon prior year costs and take into account factors like pensions, social security taxes, health insurance, and other be fringe benefit costs. The budget's been increased because in this most recent negotiation, the city was able to obtain a higher than projected uh, level of reimbursement for those fringe benefit costs. Okay, another item that is in the mod is the general corporation tax. The budget mod includes reducing OMB's forecast of the GCT revenue for fiscal 18 by 480 million or 12% from what, from what it was at adoption. This is now the third year in a row where OMB's GCT forecast ended up being $400 million over what is actually collected. Can you explain why taking down the, for, uh, the forecast so much is in, in this modification? The tax receipts for FY 2018 have fallen behind the collection plan throughout the plan period. Tax payments through December declined 11%, and the weakness is likely to continue through the remaining quarters of the fiscal year. In terms of the difficulty of forecasting this particular tax, the economics of doing this is, is rather difficult. Taxpayers have up to three years to have their final uh, settlement or, or filing done. And New York City relies on, uh, for this tax, a, a, a large portion of it from a few large payers. So accurately predicting the final outcomes of those filings, especially when you're dealing with in, you know, a, a few large filers, is more difficult than a broader base tax. Is this an area of concern for us? We continue, as always, to review all the economic data, uh, refine our forecast, and attempt to, to get the best numbers possible. All right. Uh, let me, let me um, go to um, some school support service issues. The budget modification includes $51 million uh, in, addition, in additional money for New York City uh, school support services, or uh, NYC SSS, which is uh, the nonprofit that supplies custodial services to schools. Uh, can you explain um, the $51 million in additional funding for us? Sure. The funding uh, that we're adding in the mod for this covers the cost for new buildings uh, and expanding programs such as UPRE-K, 3K, and other um, services that where we've expanded the, the number of, of facilities that we're covering. 
So the fiscal 19 preliminary budget has not in, does not include uh, any additional funding for this. How are you going about uh, making the decision about what to include in 19 and the out years? Okay, so you remember that, that uh, New York City School Sports Services was created um, in response to our uh, reform of the school custodial system. Um, under that system, as part of that reform, the DOE and the city committed themselves to a series of, of reforms and savings to be obtained through efficiencies in the way in which we deliver the service. It's our expectation that uh, between the work of DOE and, and, and New York City uh, School Sports Services that there will be no additional cost in 19 for, for, uh, for these services as they'll be subsumed in the savings from the efficiencies that I just discussed. On March 19th, the DOE, uh, the DOE sent a circular to all custodial engineers notifying them of changes to custodial budgets for the current fiscal year. The council was made aware of the recent uh, circular because school staff shared it with council members. Uh, so will OMB work with the DOE to post each school's custodial budget and any related circulars online just as the DOE does with the school allocation memos? So that question is not really covered under the MOD. Um, to believe the, the current budget uh, supports the, the budgets that have been given to the custodians and it's not affected by the MOD. So right, so you're coming to us to ask for more money and we want to understand what you need that additional dollars for. Well, as I indicated before, um, these, the costs that we're requesting money for primarily cover the cost of the new DOE buildings plus the expansion of programs such as pre -K and three, uh, U Pre-K and 3K. We've also transferred some, uh, <coughs> sorry, we've also transferred some uh, DOE costs that, that to, to NISIS formerly funded through the old ABM and TEMCO contracts, and they're now in, in, uh, they're now in New York City School Support Services as we've ended those contracts. And we're happy to, to work with the council if we want to, to look into these issues. So we would, and we would like to see some more transparency on that issue as it uh, um, applies to each individual school. It is an area of concern for us. Um, in addition, will OMB provide a copy of the DOE's uh, contract with uh, the New York City SSS to the council? Yeah, um, I will. I will check on that. I, I believe it's already publicly available, but if not, we'll, we'll look into it and let you get back to you on that. Okay. Um, and can OMB provide a cost-benefit analysis showing the rationale for the decision to create the NYC SSS? as well as provide details on the actual cost saving realized since the custodial restructuring was implemented. I think now we're, we're, we've drifted fairly far from the, from the context of the MOD. Um, that decision was reached a uh, year and a half ago, but uh, we're always happy to work with the council on sharing information. Okay, we look forward to working with you on that. Um, a question on fair student funding. On multiple occasions, including at the preliminary budget hearing on March 5th and in our follow-up letter to OMB, the council has requested that OMB provide a list of all schools uh, with their allocations, including uh, fair student funding formula, entitlement, and percentage. The, response, the responses that we've received, and we're grateful for the responses, um, has been that we should look up the information for 1,800 schools. It's impossible for us to you know, go, go on online and click on um, 1,800 schools. Is this information, uh, you know, held together in one spot where we can view it overall? And is that, if it's not, is that something that you can provide us with in the future? On a spreadsheet? We'll look, we'll look into uh, how the, I know the information is available on a school basis on the DOE website, and we'll look into whether it's available in some sort of more aggregate form. Because it's it, it just, so work intensive 
for us to go through that and to try to make decisions based on 1,800 different schools. Um, Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll look into seeing if there's a way to, to, to get the information in a way that's uh, easier for you to look at in aggregate. All right. Um, audit and property tax reserves forecast. Uh, OMB seems to chronically underestimate some revenues year after year, maintaining projections that are seemingly unbeholden to past trends. So, for example, OMB's audit revenue forca forecasts have generally been about $710 million in the adopted budgets for fiscal 2014 through 17. And finally, this year you brought up the forecast to $850 million. However, this is still well below the amount of audit revenue we get. Since fiscal uh, 14, we have consistently brought in over $1 billion in audit revenues. In fact, last year we brought in over $1.3 billion almost twice what OMB had forecast at adoption. Similarly, OMB's projections for the property tax reserve have also been consistently off, averaging around $468 million in underestimates since fiscal 2014. With this current modification, it appears that OMB will have recognized about $268 million of that typical under forecast. So presumably, we should expect another $200 million by the end of the year. While it makes sense that our revenue forecast should err a bit on the side of caution, the scale and consistency of these underestimates go beyond conservative forecasting. So it's not conservative for if it's not conservative forecasting, why have the numbers for these two revenue items consistently been so far off? A significant amount of the revenue uh, comes from large corporations, uh, and they have an incentive to minimize the revenue or tax they pay to the city. The city uses the audit process to recoup these revenues. The forecasting methodology hasn't changed. The baseline is updated for, on specific guidance from the Department of Finance based on current audit pipeline. The audit process is lagged relative to current economic conditions, which makes it harder to forecast in advance the amount of audits we'll receive. Bear in mind that these are actually results of individual by individual negotiations with, with single large taxpayers. So it's somewhat difficult to determine um, the amount of revenue we'll ultimately receive from the audits that are out there. OMB constantly communicates with the Department of Finance, talks about the status of the audits, the numbers, and where they are in the process. But the amount of time also that each audit takes is a variable that's unknown because ultimately these audits generally end when there's a settlement. What about the property tax reserve? So the, the property tax, uh, we monitor collections, refunds, delinquencies, and adjust the numbers uh, by the changes in, in year to year uh, uh, as, oh yeah, we, we change as, as the year goes on, we look at the actual collections and all of these items, update our, our forecast based on the actuals we received, and constantly refine our forecast to make it closer and closer to the actuals. Okay, so we're going to go to uh, council member questions and uh, council member Gibson. Thank you so much, Chair Drum, and good morning to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. And, you know, certainly this council um, and in the hearing before us today, we really want to get as much information as we can. We're talking about an incredible amount of money that the city is investing in a multitude of services. Um, and the chair talked a little bit about DHS, homeless services, and the $152, $169 million that we're talking about. And I specifically wanted to ask about cluster sites. Um, where we started at a little over 3,000. Many of them have predominantly been in Bronx and Brooklyn, and I represent many of those remaining cluster buildings in my district in the Bronx. 
Um, and so over the next three years, as we phase out these clusters, I joined the mayor and Commissioner Banks last year when we talked about a plan to work with all of the existing landlords um, in terms of the future operations of these buildings and the potential use of eminent domain to purchase these buildings. And so what I'd like to know is within this re-estimate that we're looking at, there's money that focuses on families with children, adult families, single adults, but what I'm not seeing is anything related to cluster housing and phasing those out. Um, are we looking at acquiring these buildings? And if so, what does that cost? So has there been any estimates in terms of cluster phasing out and how this um, estimate is a part of that? Or if it's not, please let me know what we're doing with cluster uh, phase outs. So as you know, our plan is over time to reduce our reliance on clusters. There is no, at, at this point, there is no money in this mod uh, to pay for the acquisition of, of former cluster sites. Uh, I think that's uh, something that, that, that's still under consideration, but there's no money in the mod for that. Okay. So on average, we're spending about $2 million a month to operate cluster sites, right? Okay, so where, where my concern is, is DHS is spending an incredible amount of money to provide the services that we're mandated as a city to provide for homeless families and individuals. But my concern is when you look at a budget like HPD, whose budget is predominantly federal dollars, there's no match in terms of the number of affordable housing units that we're creating. So if you look at HPD's budget and maybe HDC compared to DHS, we're spending more money to house homeless individuals and families than we are to create the affordable housing that families need to provide stability. So what I'd like to understand is in this mod, how are we presenting to the public that there's an actual priority given the mayor's housing and why and all of the efforts we've talked about, supportive housing, senior housing, how are we going to explain and justify this amount of money in a mod for DHS and not have the same level of attention given to create affordable housing? As I stated earlier, the administration really has made unprecedented efforts uh, in terms of creating an affordable housing. Uh, you know, offering uh, new programs to help finance 300,000 affordable ho housing units. Um, in addition, uh, as you know, we have an obligation to provide uh, housing, a, a <clears throat> shelter for all those who, who come and, and, and seek. As a result, uh, we are obliged to spend uh, the amount of money that we do on providing that shelter and the mod, and we're talking about the, the additional money we're adding here in this mod, reflects the, the reality that we have to provide shelter for those families and individuals. Right, so while I agree and I give credit to the mayor and the administration for the unprecedented investments, I would also say that we have an equal obligation to create affordable housing and long-term opportunities for families. So while the law mandates that we provide housing for homeless families, we also should hold ourselves accountable for creating the long-term affordable housing units. It's just a, a big difference in numbers, and I'm just having a really difficult time wrapping my head around understanding $169 million of, of funds for DHS when we don't see that same level of commitment when you talk about creating affordable housing opportunities. So I'm, I'm happy to talk offline um, because I did want to ask a question in the same vein of DHS. $116 million of this mod focuses on single adults. Is that related to the recent um, articles that we've heard and seen about individuals that are coming home on parole from state prison that are being sent directly to single adult shelters in our city 
where we are obligated to provide housing for them. So this is an incredible amount of money um, to expend on single adults and housing them, but is there a correlation? And if the city has recognized that, what are we doing to work with the state to ensure that there's a greater partnership so individuals coming home on parole are not sent directly to shelters. It's never been that way. I served in Albany and we've never had a process where we've done that. So to me, that's something new and I don't know if DHS is aware of that, but what is OMB doing to draw down on things of that nature where state programs and state agencies are adding to our burden of homeless individuals? I mean, the the, uh, the re-estimate we're doing here, you know, deals with the, the reality of, of the census and, and the right to shelter. Um, I don't know that, uh, you know, you're correct that we're about 116 is for adults and, and about 34 is for families. Um, whether that, you know, has a strong correlation with people being, who are being released from incarceration, I don't know. Okay. So I certainly would ask this administration and ONB to work with the state on identifying where these numbers are coming from. There are root causes to the homelessness crisis that we face. And we've identified many in domestic situations, eviction, and that's why this council has supported measures like right to counsel. But if we're seeing numbers that are that high where individuals are coming home from prison on parole and they're coming into our shelter system, we have a problem. And it is on our, us and our responsibility to make sure that we work with our counterparts in the state to figure out how we can address this so that the numbers don't continue to rise. Otherwise, you guys are going to return to us with budget mods that continue to increase and increase and increase. And we're going to have greater problems here at this council. So I would appreciate having a further conversation and implore my chair to really talk about single adults that are coming home from prison specifically and how we can work with the state in addressing that. Happy thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you, and, and just to add to it, a lot of problems in those shelters too. I mean, it's incredible that people are sent to them. But anyway, it, it will go, well, that's not what this purpose of the hearing is. We're now gonna go to questions by uh, Councilmember Lanceman, Grudenchik, Cohen, and, and then others. Thank you, good morning. Good morning. So I have a question on the, um, <clears throat> school support services and custodial operations and the, the memo that uh, the chair referenced earlier. My understanding, the school support services, the $50 million, that, that's an obligation that the city has to, to pay, right? I mean, you, you've got to, if, if somehow this mod didn't happen, you, you've still got to come up with that $50 million, right? In order to provide the services at the level that, that we would want to see, we, we would need the $51 million. Okay, so uh, give me some more information about the $21 million cut to custodial operations. I, I see that it's divided into two. 9.9 .9 million in savings associated with custodial engineers taking on additional assignments following the transition to New York City um, school support services, and then $10.6 million in savings from custodial service contracts that have ended. Can you just explain those, those, those two uh, pieces of it? And then I want to ask about the memo. As part of the efficiencies we sought in reforming the custodial uh, services um, at the Department of Education, when uh, we sought to have changes in the labor contracts with the uh, custodial engineers that allowed us to reduce the amount of what are called temporary cares. Um, in place of that, what the labor contract allowed us to do was to merge schools that were in reasonably close proximity and of a certain square footage. So that instead of paying uh, a custodian essentially double salary to cover two schools, 
we would merge the schools for custodial purposes into one plant, combine the square footage, and pay the single custodian to manage both buildings more than they would have received in either of the two buildings, but less certainly than we were paying under the system of temporary care. So as, as those uh, opportunities present themselves to merge schools, we're able to obtain savings. This 9.9 uh, .9 million reflects a decrease in those temporary care positions um, and the a net of the cost of paying the, the, the single custodian more in, to cover both schools. And the 10.6 million? <clears throat> the 10.6 million represents the savings from the, uh, the ending of the Temco ABM contracts where we used to have outside vendors provide the services and now a combination of our own custodial engineers and New York City uh, school support service employees provide those services. Yeah. So I know that you had said to the chair that the, um, the memo, the circular that was sent out in March to the custodians um, about cuts to their present budget, that it's your position or your view that that's not part of the modification but for me as a council member and having to consider whether to support all the elements of the modification, <clears throat> I, I can't look at it in, in isolation. I have to look at it in, in context. And the context seems to be that there are going to be cuts in addition to the cuts that are in the mod that custodians, our school sc custodians are gonna have to, to deal with. So I have to ask you about the cuts that are in this memo and if you can't, explain them to me and put them in the context of, of the cuts that are in the mod, I don't see how I could support that aspect of, of, of the modification. What's particularly troubling to me about the, the circular is the cuts to supplies and equipment. This is a budget, as you know, uh, custodians are given a budget at the start of the year. They plan throughout the year. They literally sit down with the principal and come up with a plan which is part of what they are going to be evaluated on as custodians. And now in March, with a few months left in the fiscal year, they are told that they need to make cuts. So could you explain to me what these cuts are and how much money is being saved by them and why the savings that are in this modification can't cover these cuts without disrupting what the custodians are doing in the schools? Did you get that or want me to repeat? No, I, I, I did. Um, we'll get back to you with um, some more detail on this. Um, generally speaking, this is a question of the custodial budgets uh, being right-sized uh, for their buildings. All part of our plan that we discussed and announced when we, uh, when we announced the, the reform of the custodial system. But you would agree, right, that the time to right-size the budget is when you enact the budget and then custodians can plan for that year, or any agency can plan for that, that year. And now you are putting them in a difficult position where in, in mid to late April, they've got to figure out, well, how are they going to manage this cut over the next few months? Um, my time has expired, but I, I do want to say, and I don't want it to be a surprise to the administration, unless you can get me an answer to that and to these questions by the time that we're called upon to vote on this modification, it'd be difficult for me to support including that aspect of the mod in, 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 our, in our vote. And Council Thank you very just, much. Just to also state that um, uh, some of these are agency-specific questions that need to you know, get further details from the agency themselves. So I don't know that the administration was fully prepared to answer that. They were specifically just here to answer why the cut is needed in, in that particular area or why there's an increase in another area. But we will follow up with you on that. Yeah, I don't, listen, I understand you can't come and be prepared to answer every single question under the sun, and so I don't criticize you for that, but you are asking me to vote on a, on a, on a, on a substantial cut in, um, in the budget as it relates to the custodians and in, in, in their operations, and, and it's impossible for me to separate this cut in the mod and these reductions in mod from, from the other cut. I, it has to be, I have to understand it in the whole. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we have been joined by Councilman Steve Matteo, Lori Cumbo, 
uh, Councilmember Francisco Moya, Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, and Councilmember Kalman Yeager. Uh, and now we will go to a question from Councilmember Cohen, followed by Cornegie. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I think my question is, you know, it's process oriented, so I, you know, sort of along the lines of what Councilmember Lansman is asking, like for instance, like the law department, we're going to add uh, 9.8 million dollars. Like, is that money already spent, or are you coming and saying we would like to move it and spend it? Uh, and is it a an existing liability? Where is that money going? Uh, uh, and again, I don't mean to specifically, and you may not be prepared to answer specifically, but I really want to know is like it's. It's April. If if we allocate, you know, if I made an allocation, or tried to make an allocation now to a group, they had, they wouldn't be able to spend the money. We wouldn't be able to get the money to them. Have you? So I guess what I'm trying to ask: Are we are we approving changes that have already been made, or or we would like to make these changes and then we'll spend the money? So I think the, the, the question um, depends a bit on how specific you are. Some, some of the items that are, that are in the, the mod, some money may have been already spent. In many cases, there were, we still have, you know, if you think about even your question about the law department and $10 million relative to the size of their budget, um, it's not as though they, 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 they haven't, don't have $10 million unspent at this point. We, we, and we generally, the spending that we've done is because we have to meet legal mandates or other things that are uh, absolute obligations. I get, like, again, you know, the law department, no, it's, you know, nobody, there's no passions involved in it one way or the other. Pay. Yeah, I did, really. Um, but it, th there is an existing liability that you want to pay. There's a new program you want to do, like, and, and I get, you may, not, you may not know what the money is for. Us. And, and I think the answer, you know, uh, if you look at the details in, uh, of the spending, is that they're, they're all different things, right? There are legal mandates where money may have already been spent. There are new programs that we're, we're looking to, to launch. But there are also, you know, re-estimates of the cost of, of running a current program or maybe more people came for our service or, or in some cases where we, we were reducing or less people may have availed themselves of the service. Uh, I, I think that, you know, and, and I understand that there have been oversight hearings on these agencies and, you know, I, I don't even know, I don't even know what committee would cover the law department, to be perfectly honest. So, um, it's, it's, you know, it's a little hard in this context to understand, but I, I appreciate uh, giving it a try. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think what Councilmember Cohen is trying to get at is that if the money is not in the U of A, then it should not really be spent before they come to us to ask to spend it. So that is something that we're trying to get at here at the heart of, of this hearing. Uh, and uh, we're going to work on that and um, improve that process. Thank you. Councilmember Cornegie. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, in an attempt not to uh, beat a dead horse, um, statistically, it's been shown that uh, it's four times as expensive to temporarily house a family in transitional housing than it is to provide long-term sustainable housing. My question is, has there been a, a plan as it relates to the budget to transition families into long-term sustainable housing? Uh, with the numbers that you're asking for here and what the budget already exists at, uh, we're clear that we could put you know, families, program and I understand this is programmatic, but it's also fiscal. We can actually put families in a long-term pathway to sustainable housing. Um, are we prepared to transition with the same monies and not start a whole new pot for long-term sustainable housing? Are we looking at every family and when they get into a position, once they're sustained in the system and moving them uh, relatively quickly into long-term housing with some of the programs that are available, whether it's Section 8, whether, I mean, whatever programs, can we shift these dollars relatively quickly, pivot them, if you will, quickly to sustainable housing? You know, our, our, obviously our goal is to, to move people out of shelter and into housing in general. Um, we've rehoused over 71,000 New Yorkers 
in the past four years. Uh, we were actually rehousing 200 families with children every week. There's no question, uh, like you, we share a commitment to try to move people out of temporary shelter and into permanent housing. Uh, we, we spend a, a considerable amount of money on, on doing those activities, but people have a right to shelter, and that's why we need to uh, continue to, to spend the, the amount of money that we're looking to see in this, in this mod um, to provide shelter for those people who seek it. And just lastly, how much of the dollars that you're asking for us to commit are for long-term improvements to facilities uh, like hotels, like temporary, temporary shelter facilities that are requiring long-term commitments of money? So on the expense portion that we're looking for here, we don't have it broken out, but it does include the, uh, the costs for maintenance, uh, security, and those types of things at our existing facilities. All right, thank you. I, I think um, my colleagues have been uh, asked, asked pretty, que pretty uh, poignant questions, and I'm just hoping that we can get the answers before this commitment is made. Thank you. And we have a question from Council Member Adams. Good morning. Good morning. It's just a, a little feeling of incompletion uh, with me with the line of questioning, so just uh, if you will indulge me just a little bit more. Along the lines of questioning uh, from uh, Council Member Lansman and Council Member Cohen as far as the spending that, um, that has already taken place, is there a way of knowing or do you know whether or not the, whether or not a majority of this spending has already taken place or not? So we, we don't have a, a clear breakout, uh, you know, to answer your question. Uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, this, this being ongoing programs that have ebbing and flowing demand. Uh, so we're, we're spending money uh, when demand is there, and uh, we don't have necessarily a clear, bright line distinction about, you know, how much is already versus the rest of the year. Uh, however, we will try to do something to uh, come up with a, with a reasonable estimate of that. Okay, and, and as my colleagues have already stated, I, I would also suggest that we really get a handle on this, uh, on this because this exercise uh, for me in particular this morning is a little bit disconcerting uh, to see these items coming before this council at this uh, late stage of the game, but I thank you very much for your time this morning. You're welcome. Okay, Council Member yeah. Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for indulging me. I'm not a member of this committee. I appreciate it. Um, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I'm going to ask the same question that Councilmember Cohen and uh, Councilmember Adams asked, but in a different way. If the council does not approve the budget mod, would you not be able to spend, for example, the $152 million that uh, you have listed here as going to the Department of Homeless Services? So I think a, a failure to, to, to pass the mod would mean, uh, in some cases, a significant impact on the ability for the city to continue to provide services. Okay. Um, I know there's a, a large number of items in addition that the council has expressed interest in moving money around. All of that presumably would not be able to happen. So if, the, uh, if there are currently homeless people who are being housed, uh, you've made accommodations for them and uh, the Department of Homeless Services has put them up somewhere and is paying for it, and the city stops writing a check. I assume that that means that there are some people who are going to be rehomeless. I know that's not a word, but it's a thing. Uh, would that happen? You know, I don't. I don't want to think about that being an actual outcome. But I mean, clearly there 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 are risks that that take place if we were unable to pay our vendors. Okay, thank you. I have nothing further. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilmember Gudenchik. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Still morning, right? Still morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I am going to beat that horse a little more, and it's just not so much that I want an answer, but you know, you're coming to us this morning and asking us to spend $152 million more, and I know that nobody in this room is the Commissioner of Homeless Services or uh, Mr. Banks is not here, Commissioner of Social Services. It's a staggering amount of money, and I know that OMB are the numbers people in the administration, so I hope you will go back and talk to Ms. Hartzog and the other people in the administration and say that we're spending a lot more money for the same amount of people. It's not that homelessness has risen in this city. It's, he it's held fairly steady at or around 60,000. It's just below 60,000 this morning, according to the DHS website. But the amount of money that we're spending on this problem is going into the stratosphere. And I think some of my other colleagues have touched on this. And I don't think that anybody here wants to see people living in the streets. It bothers me to a, a great deal. But I do not believe that we are getting a sufficient bang for our buck. And I will leave it at that. My question um, is really about miscellaneous. And I'm looking down this long list that I have here that's been prepared by uh, the council staff. And miscellaneous out of a $970 million mod is $513 million, which is nearly 53%. And um, if my staff came to me and they said they needed to spend 53% of a budget mod on miscellaneous, I'd have a lot of questions. So my question, I'll give you one, what the hell is in here? It's a lot of money. Sure. Uh, you know, the, the title miscellaneous is always sort of uh, uh, sounds like, well, what, what is all that? In, in this case, though, what you're seeing, the, the big item in the miscellaneous budget is the reduction of the general reserve by $500 million. Um, typically, this time of year, we take down the, the reserve by that amount, and that's, that's what's driving that and big wh number. Where's that reserve? Where's that $500 million going? Is it going into next fiscal year? That money is, is, is no longer an expense, right, in, in the current year, um, and it's supporting the it's yeah. It's supporting the the current budget, uh, that you know, the preliminary budget, including the prepayment you saw, that was forecast in that. So where is it? Where, where is it? So it's coming from the reserve. We're we're reducing the general reserve, which we generally do at this time of year, and that supports current spending. That current spending includes the the prepayment um, from this year into next. All right, Mr. Majewski's nodding, so I guess it's okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we would like to see if we can get a breakdown of the mod about what has been spent prior to the hearing today, uh, prior to us voting on this, and uh, we'll be following up with you on that. Okay, and with that, we'd like to say thank you for coming in and for answering our questions on this request for a budget modification. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. And with that, this uh, hearing is adjourned at 11.18 in the morning. <laughs>